Hey there. Oh, somebody's here. Awesome. Can you give me a hello so I know if the comments are on? That'd be great. Since YouTube wants to always muck with my my stuff here. Let's see. There we go. Hopefully that'll do it. Um, if you don't feel like commenting, I understand. I just want to see if they're working one more time. Okay. All right. So, we're not going to go over this whole thing because it's a lot. Um, a viewer sent this in. Virginia Dare, thank you. I've been pretty much down the proverbial rabbit hole for a couple days here, and I need something else to look at. But, of course, this also led me down another pathway um, with its own issues. <laughs> so, let's start here real quick. And then we're going to go back, because you know I'm big on etymology. Then we're going to go back to um, the page that she sent in. It's actually a page that is no longer functioning. Um, it is a... I guess nobody wants to come and hello just so I know if it's working. <laughs> um, it is a quote-unquote dead website. Uh, it looks like they use the Wayback Machine, which is awesome. Um, I wish I knew how to use that. But I don't. <laughs> so I'll learn. Because uh, I keep wanting to and I keep forgetting about it. There's just a lot. And I like to research. And I like to be informed about what's going on. Um, and what they're talking about. We should know by now that the headlines we see in the news and the media are just that. They are messages. Not to us, but to one another. And the more we learn how to defragment those or break them down the better off we'll be. So, sorry if the comments aren't working. I tried to check them a couple of times. It shows that they're on. So, if they're not on, um, I, you know, I apologize. I'll try one last time. Okay. Alright, so let's get to it. Oh, I hate ads, but I'm not paying for an app that's free. Um, Eclipse, circa 1300, from Old French, Eclipse, Eclipse Darkness. Um, from Latin, eclipsis, from Greek, eclipsis, an eclipse, an abandonment. Ooh, literally, a failing or forsaking. From eclipin, ec eclipine, sorry, to forsake a usual place, fail to appear, be eclipsed by. And, uh, they often talk, you can use that in, like, a metaphorical way or a parabolic way. So, that's what's meant by, like, a failing or forsaking. Sorry, Sammy. <laughs> um, I guess he's not into etymology. And it shows you here, ek in Greek means out. Lipin, lipin, Greek means to leave, okay? Eclipin, eclipine, eclipine, I think. To forsake a usual place, fail to appear, be eclipsed. Um, eclipses, an eclipse, an abandonment, a failing or forsaking, and then this is transliteration, right? So you start with these and break it down, and then you go backwards. Um, and then so the Old French is there. Um, to cause an eclipse of, from Old French, see eclipse, to suffer an eclipse. X meaning out or from, but also upwards, completely deprive of, without, and former. Without light is often what an eclipse will do because the um, moon or the earth go in front of the sun or the moon, depending on what kind of eclipse it is, whether it's lunar or solar. So now we are going to go, just so you all know, I did try another search engine that was not Google, and I came up with the same uh, list of results. So we're just going to go ahead and use Google. For the uh, sake of continuity, because if they if they censor Google, they have to censor themselves because they are affiliated. So this is what Virginia sent me. Um, this is the link or website that is no longer producing new content, basically. And it looks like this particular piece is from May 17th, 2022. So it's really not that old. Um, and it couldn't be with, with the information that we're about to look at. So I'm going to make it a little bigger. It's huge when it's a not on the de desktop site. 
So this is so that you guys, if you want to, you can read along. But as usual, you don't have to. Um, I like to read, so I don't mind doing it for everybody, kind of. Um, and then you can click the links here, and it will show you um, their source, their sources, which is awesome. Um, I like when people include their own sources. It's not that I don't like to go back and research their their research, um, but it, it's just more credible when when they actually you know jot down where they got the information. So, can you guide Arcturus with his sons? Job eight thirty eight thirty two. So we're going to toggle over here to the Bible app. And this is the Catholic version. Where did you go? Oh, please. So this is a conversation between Job and God. And God is asking him, you know, he's basically telling him not, God is telling Job not to worry, right? Um, that he should not concern himself with his troubles of tomorrow, that God will take care of him. And so he's basically asking him, you know, did you set the foundations for the earth? And obviously he did not. And so this is not God bragging per se. It's God saying, you know, I'll take care of you. I got you. I got this. I got your back type of thing. And so we have the strength to join together the sparkling stars of the Pleiades. Pleiades. Or are you able to disperse the circling of Arcturus? Okay. So again, um, I'm not doubting that there's some type of thing going on out there as far as, um, you know, health-wise. i got to be careful what I say there. Um, but the names that they're choosing, you know, at first it was Beta Delta Alpha, um, which is, those are all forms of uh, sleep. They are all different levels of sleeping, uh, which is interesting, you know, that they chose that. It's also the Greek alphabet, so there you go with that. Um, so there's the verse that it came from. I just wanted to show you guys. And so it says, in the book of Job, the last chapter is found a very long lecture to Job given by Almighty God himself. Again, I wouldn't personally call it a lecture, but whatever. Uh, semantics. And in this amazing lecture, God asked Job various questions. However, the questions God asked were probably far beyond what Job could comprehend, much less give an answer to. Okay. Arcturus with his sons. But among the various questions asked Job were some very curious ones about the stars. Oh, wait a second. There's a... Where's it at? Arcturus, the star that wise men follow. That's, you know, obviously key, uh, biblically speaking. And this is why I say, you know, there are people who say that the Bible is nothing but a book of metaphors and parabolics and this, that, and the other. It is many things as one, at once. That's why I think it's pretty amazing how it was put together. Um, you can use it for farming. Uh, it's great with that. You can use it as a law book. It's great for, you know, legalese. You can use it as a, a moral book, you know, for morals, of course, obviously. Um, and you can use it. There's obviously codes in there for constellations and the star system and astronomy. Um, not to be accused, uh, confused with astrology, okay? And there's nothing wrong with learning about the place in which you live so you can better operate in it. Again, we are told a lot of things are off limits just to keep us in ignorance and in the dark, all right? If they tell you, don't look at this, don't look at that, you know, once they have you indoctrinated into whatever religion... And again, I'm, I'm not going to get into arguments about uh, religion and faith and all that. Um, there are ups and there are downs. There, there are pros and cons, just like with everything in this place. Um, it's all binary. It's all, you know, shadow and light. All right. So in the book of Job, the last chapter is found a very long lecture to Job given by Almighty God himself. And in this amazing lecture, God asked Job various questions. However, the questions God asked were probably far beyond what Job could comprehend, much less give an answer to. Arcturus with his sons, but among the various questions asked Job were some various curi very curious ones about the stars. And one of those questions about the stars was, can you guide Arcturus with his sons? Now Job, like many ancient wise men, probably realized that Arcturus was that very bright star in the night skies. But what in the world was God talking about when he asked Job if he could guide Arcturus with his sons? How could a star have sons? 
And how could Job possibly got a star? What strange questions for God to be asking a mere mortal man. Um, so you can look also, again, there are at least usually I say three different meanings to a verse. Oh, and the Bible is also a history book because it does, you know, they've already proven the great flood was all over um, and it's written of in other other uh, cultures. And right here, I would say, you know, just looking at this, um, each verse has a couple of different meanings, but usually you're dealing with spiritual and material, right? And so um, you could also look at the fact that stars are parallel or, or sometimes interchangeable, depending on what you're reading, with angels. So angels and their sons, possibly, okay? Uh, so there is that. And I find it ironic that they're calling this eclipse the hybrid eclipse, right? And what would the angel sons be other than hybrids? And again, I'm reading this pretty much for the first time with you. I apologize. I'm closing the window because you can hear the cars going by and it's distracting. Sorry about that. I'm just some woman in her bedroom. I don't, <laughs> I don't have a studio or nothing like that. Now, Job, like many ancient wise men, oh, sorry, read that. Mystery finished, Revelation 10, 7. And so this puzzling question, which God asked Job, can you guide a with his sons, was never answered. And the Bible seems silent on this question. And so this question has remained a mystery for thousands of years until now. You see, God, according to his eternal purpose, not to mention his infinite patience, his patience must be so vast because I certainly, like, like I'm a human being and learning what I've learned about this place and how things are done and that we're not all of mankind, God is definitely patient because I, I would not be such. Sorry, dry pipes. So you see, God, according to his eternal purpose, has kept these things secret until now. Yes, God is beginning to reveal these mysterious signs in the heavens. And now we are discovering that God has written his marvelous love story in the heavens, using the various constellations as picture symbols. And this should be no surprise. After all, God plainly declare, declares in Psalms, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Psalm 19.1 But the heavens also declare God's righteousness as is written, and the heavens shall declare his righteousness. Selah, Psalm 50, verse 6 various signs spoken of. Now, as far as those who searched the Bible prophecy concerning stars of the end, most of us were expecting extraordinary heavenly phenomena, you know, such things as giant asteroids or other colossal cataclysmic occurrences. Various signs mentioned, but you see, God has mentioned various constellations in scriptures, Orion, the Pleiades, Maseroth, etc., but he also spoke in Revelation of great signs. In the heavens, a woman with child, a dragon who swept a third of the stars, and Michael who fought against that dragon. Hold, please. Okay, so Revelation means a revealing. It is also called um, in the KJV Apocrypha and in the Catholic Bible, um, uh, Dewey Rames as well, because that's also a Catholic version, Revelation chapter 12. So let me let me bring something up here because... It doesn't seem to be in any type of chronological order. Yes, there are things that are prophetic, but there are also things that are just coming upon John. It says the revelation of Jesus Christ, John's apocalypse. So he is seeing things about Christ in his life and, and the plan God has for him. Okay. A lot of people don't know this. If you're not Catholic, uh, but I was raised Catholic, so I can tell you a woman with ch child, um, because she, she has stars on her a crown. Mary is always pictured with a head covering with stars on it. Okay. And I'll, I'll show you that if I have a moment. Um, I think it's actually my screensaver. So I might have to go back there anyways. But, um, and with child, right. And the dragon being re uh, symbolic for Satan. And Michael, who fights against that dragon. Okay. So that is Mary they're talking about with child. And the dragon who swept a third one, third of the stars. And so that is correct, right? Satan took 
a third of the stars and or angels with him. So not everything in there is in chronological order. A lot of people who only have the KJV and they don't have like a catechism or they didn't have catechism classes like I did from, I don't know, the time I was in kindergarten till about 15, 16, whatever day um, age first confirmation is or confirmation is. Um, I took catechism every Saturday and went to church every Sunday. So I can recognize what these things are, even though it was so long ago and we weren't taught certain things. Um, it's just recognizable to me because I, I, you know, we know Mary and we know what she looks like and we have um, icons of her and, you know, the Byzantines and there's paintings of her and all that. So this, you need to understand, is talking about Mary and Jesus and Satan and the enmity between the woman and the er, and um, the woman's seed, which is Christ, and, and the serpent, okay? I hope that makes sense to you guys. I know not a lot of people like the Catholic Church. I'm not going to get into, like, the dogmatic stuff, but this is, um, it's recognizable to those of us who were raised that way. The Bible also speaks of other signs in the heavens, and it is the purpose of Signs of Heaven website to introduce these wonderful signs and to reveal the many Bible passages which explain them. So here's the thing. I might disagree with some of this because, again, if you're looking at just the KV, KJV, right, and you're raised like, I don't know, Protestant, Presbyterian, Bath, Baptist, Lutheran, Methodist, you're not going to get the fullness of these stories uh, because there are books missing and because they, they disregard Mary. Um, and that's just the truth. Lay up treasures in heaven. Matthew 6, 20. My fruit is better than gold, yea, than fine gold, and my revenue than choice silver. I lean in the way of righteousness in the midst of the pass of judgment, that I may cause those that love me to inherit substance, and I will fill their treasures. Proverbs eight nineteen through 21. This above passage speaks of a pathway which leads to riches and treasures. Reminds me of the rainbow, how um, at the end of the rainbow, there's the pot of gold. <laughs> yes, God is just now, oh, just now revealing the long-awaited signs as it is written. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, Luke 21, 25. And that's obviously um, prophetic, right? Because Luke and, and the Gospels were written after Christ died, not as many years as we're told. It's literally within like 50 years Paul was writing um, the Gospels. So Luke and Mark uh, were there and Matthew. So, and God is just now opening up a pathway to the stars, a figurative gate to heaven itself, which is ironic because I was just reading about how there are six gates in the sun in the book of Enoch. It tells you he it is heaven is revealed to him, right? And ironically, it's six. There are six gateways in the east um, in the sun, and then to the west there are six, okay? So it, it, gateway, portal, you get the picture. You see how deep this stuff goes? It, it's, it's very, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Multipurposed. You know, that the, you can look at these things and learn a variety of different things from them, no matter how many times you read them. Uh, but be warned, this message is a warning for each of us to renounce this evil world, world of selfishness and a call for us to come to follow Jesus as one of his disciples. And by becoming his disciple, the reader will discover that it will require everything as far as the self-seeking earthly pleasures, riches, desires, and aspirations that this present world has to offer. A billionaire, no, a trillionaire. Listen, blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments. His seed shall be mighty upon earth, and that's Christ. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Um, wealth and riches shall be in his house, and his righteousness endureth forever. Okay. Nevertheless, by becoming a true follower of Jesus, the Christian will become one of the wealthiest persons on earth. A billionaire, no, a trillionaire. How is this possible? This is because as God's child, God has promised eternal life to those who persevere in following him. 
And of course, everlasting life is worth more than all the riches than this world could possibly give. Wouldn't you agree? Everlasting life, not to be confused with immortality, because again, I'm learning, um, you know, these these word games that, that they play. But if that's not enough, the redeemed will eventually inherit the vast riches of love and knowledge and wisdom and everlasting life and all the treasures that heaven has to offer. As it is written, he that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Revelation 21, 7. In heavenly courts above, and the faithful follower of Jesus will be of those who unravel, unravel unfathomable mysteries. And the Christian will embark on incredible spiritual journeys far above the heavens into the heavenly throne room of God and far by, beyond anything mankind can conceive or dream of. And though right now the child of God won't literally see these things, but with his or her mind's eye, they will dwell in heaven itself, seated with Christ in the heavenly throne room of God. Love and sympathy unlimited. And furthermore, you will gain a love and sympathy and understanding for lost sinners. Just as the great love which Jesus has for miserable sinners, miserable sinners such as you and I. So don't hesitate. And don't be afraid to follow Jesus. We have everything to gain, and we will have all eternity to enjoy it. Now that's true riches, my friend. That is true riches. So here we go. There shall come a star out of Jacob. Numbers twenty four seventeen. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east, and are come to worship him. Matthew 2, 1, 2. There exists a lot of intrigue regarding just what star did the Magi from the East follow, which led them to the first advent of our Savior. And I believe this is Arcturus. The Bible speaks of Arcturus as a possibility. Canst thou guide Arcturus with his sons? Okay. And again, there's another possible meaning. 38, 33. We got that 33 there. Arcturus may well, very well have been that star. Nobody knows for certain because God can perform miraculous deeds beyond anything we can imagine. In simple terms, there's nothing that's impossible for God. Luke one thirty seven. Type of wise men of old, but there is a much greater question which confronts mankind today. Because just as a single star guided those wise men to the coming Savior, so also God is just now giving us a star plus many other stars, to guide us safely to the second coming of our Lord and Savior. And so the starry guide, Arcturus, appears to be the type fulfillment of those wise men following the star 2,000 years ago. We must keep in mind that those wise men of old, after spending countless hours searching the scriptures to see just exactly what and who those prophecies were pointing to, traveled through the deserts hundreds of miles to find the Messiah. And so are you willing to spend months praying and searching out this message in light of God's word to see if this message is the real thing? In other words, are you truly the last day fulfillment of those wise men of old? Are you willing to put out the same effort that those wise men of old put out to discover the truth? And with this meaning, you don't even have to travel hundreds of miles. But to really understand this message does take a great deal of effort. But wise men don't mind that. After all, that's exactly the stuff that wise men are made of. Guide us to Heaven's Gate. <laughs> Heaven's Gate, name of a cult, which is ironic because in a minute here we're going to jump over um, and look at uh, eclipse cults. Just don't hang on. Light and dark, right? We have to be balanced and we have to understand there's more than one meaning for a lot of things. And Arcturus is that brilliant star, one of the brightest in our heavens, which leads these gospel constellations, summer, fall, and winter constellations, to present a picture story, a heavenly allegory of sorts, these constellations which together tell the incredible love of God. And Arcturus, our host star, will lead to an understanding of God's word. Okay, so we don't have to read all that. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And sign, uh, Signs of Heaven website will direct the reader to God's Word in such a way as to bring out certain Bible truths not currently recognized. And it's ironic that um, this was put out about a year ago before Arcturus was in the media, right? So again, we have 
we have messages that come forth from the enemies that are for each other. But if you are a child of God, you can also um, discern these messages. And I do believe we have helpers here, um, light and dark, right? Uh, much like the uh, Star Wars, you have uh, the Sith and you have uh, Yoda, right? The forces, uh, the force of evil and the force of good. Locating Arcturus. Um, we already know where that's at, but an easy way to find Arcturus is to follow the arc of the handle of the Big Dipper in the spring through fall. These are the months in which Arcturus is visible. Summer Constellation Star Chart. So it's going to tell you right there. Um, and that's ironic that it says Arc, right, in the beginning, because uh, the Ark of the Covenant. Come follow me. The bright and beautiful star known as Arcturus leads a heavenly entourage westward and northward <clears throat> each night through the heavens with his sons and daughters. That brilliant star, just like that star in the east, which guided the wise men of old, and just like Jesus, who guided his faithful disciples, so too Arcturus seems to be a representation of Christ. Thus can you guide Arcturus with his sons seems really to be speaking of Christ. Oh. I don't know if I would have went there with it. That is, Arcturus leads his nightly procession of constellations through the skies, giving a heavenly parable of how our Lord not only led his disciples through the Holy Land, but likewise leads his followers today. <clears throat> but who is Arcturus guiding? Just who is Arcturus guiding? After all, Scripture says, can you guide Arcturus with his sons? Well, obviously, the short answer is he's guiding his sons. But why are these constellations to be considered the sons of Arcturus? These summer constellations represent the gospel as presented in Revelation chapter 12. Signs in heaven <clears throat> shows the reader just how all these stars and constellations present the gospel story in these heavenly pictures. And that's why God is awesome. Because there is a representation, or I believe almost... Um, a star for every person and that might very well be your guardian angel your guiding star um it's just a, a theory as far as uh, parables go that i have because everything that you see in the heavens as above so below and also um and the our father says the same thing it's not me being satanic all right so let's not let's not confuse please um No, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Blabbing on and on. Um, oh, for example, in Greek mythology, um, you have uh, Cassiopeia, which we've talked about at length. So Cassiopeia was put in the heavens upside down for half of the year because of her vanity, right? <clears throat> so is she also a little G god and a constellation both? Did she actually walk the earth? Um, it would seem possible, possibly yes, and with all of the statues and paintings and all these things that there are, there had to be models for them, uh, but we'll get to that later. We're going to actually do a video research that I did on the begin in the original, ugh, sorry, on the original channel regarding um, statues that are missing limbs and how some of them, a lot of them are missing their noses. We're going to talk about that, uh, but not in this video, sorry. Can you guide Arcturus with his sons? So it gets into like the summer constellations, double entendres. That's key for understanding the Bible, but also the enemy. The enemy uses these double entendres so that people like us, if we're standing around, we don't actually know what's being said and they're passage, passing messages back and forth. I actually picked up on that from the people around me who were speaking this way. Uh, so yeah, um, little life experience there as well. But as is seen by this other sketch, there are more constellations involved. This sketch shows a box with a star on each end. This represents the Ark of the Covenant. And this other sketch to the right shows the seven stars constellation, aka the Big Dipper. Those five constellations, seven counting the two double entendres already mentioned, listed above, make up what is known as the summer constellations. And then we have uh, the fall constellations. The Valley of Decision constellation. Now, Arcturus is not just guiding the summer constellations. 
Know that bright and beautiful star is also guiding the fall constellations. And these are known as the Valley of Decision constellation group. Valley of Decision. Boy, that, that sounds almost morbid, cryptic. <laughs> of course, this concept of the Valley of Decisions can be found in Joel. Multitudes, multitudes in the Valley of Decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the Valley of Decision. Hmm. Now, I find it very telling also that we've had all these eclipses and all these blood moons and all these blue moons and pink moons and things that weren't a thing when I was a kid, when I was a child. Um, it really does seem like Christ is is coming back soon. Uh, if you, you know, if you're reading that from the stars, if you're looking to the stars. And and the stars are also, it's like a sky map, right? Because, um, you know, they followed the star and they, they went to where it was brightest and they were underneath of it and knew that, that the Christ child was somewhere in that vicinity. Okay. So God is revealing or rather hinting of this constellation group way back in the days of Joel. But God is no longer hinting, but now revealing this constellation group at this present hour. So if ever there was a time to take heed to the words of Joel, it is now. This constellation group is all about a decision. And this is a very good point uh, that he's about to make here, I believe. Am I willing to lay down my life to follow Christ? Am I willing for Christ's sake to endure the hardships and tribulation, which all Christians must endure? Will I allow God to do a work in me to crucify that old man of sin within so that Christ can freely live out his life through me. This constellation group can best be seen in late summer through fall, when it is in the eastern skies. It speaks of the valley in which every person who comes into the world uh, must walk at one time or another in his or her life. Read, read this for sure and find out how the Andromeda galaxy concerns us. Oh my gosh, that's where Cassiopeia is. I did a, a lesson on that at... Oh not a lesson. I'm not a teacher. I did a video on that um, way back because Cassiopeia is mentioned in two John Cusack movies, the same exact line, two different movies from like uh, 15 to 20 years apart. So that's very odd. And in both, he's telling the woman how the moles on her arm look like Cassiopeia, which is kind of like a W. And Cassiopeia is in the Andromeda galaxy. Okay. Um, the Andromeda galaxy appears as if it is traveling up the mountain, and this is very good news. Read and find out why. So here it goes. You can see that. And these are the constellations. And again, as above, so below, um, as in, as on earth, as in heaven, as also on earth, as the, our father says. So you can just go on and on with all these different parables. Now, for the sake of time, and because this is super long, um, I am going to jump now to something else because tomorrow is this eclipse. And I think it's a good idea to just, again, be aware of certain things. And uh, it's not me being dark, right? It's me trying to shine a light on the darkness so that people who might be in fear have that fear removed. Um, there's no point in being afraid of, of much of anything in life. Uh, other than God's wrath, you know, other than the one who made this place and puts certain things into action because the universe has this natural law that God put in place and justice is one of those things. And justice for me is if you think of the scales of justice, things have to have to equal out, right? So in science, that would be called like a proton and a, and a neutron. One is positive, one is minus. It's just, it's everywhere, right? And people want to tear up the Bible, and the Bible is like our foundation. All right, so you can see what I searched here, okay? It's important to know because and since time immemorial, there's nothing new under the sun. The Druids, the Mayans, um, the Aztecs, you know, all these different groups of people, uh, sorcerers, they all seem to need the blood energy, life energy, to be able to do certain things, magically speaking. I'm not saying I agree with it. I'm saying it's good to be aware, um, especially if you're a Christ follower. This is why so many people are falling, falling away. They see that it's coming and they're getting scared, right? And so they don't want to 
they don't want to be a part of of the tribulation, right? Um, but like I said, it's really not going to be just Christ followers. You're going to have certain things happening to certain people um, who are vocal, who are champions for children, let's say, uh, independent thinkers, traditionalists, nonconformists, uh, people who don't particularly want to follow laws that go against natural law, right? Man's law. So let's go on. Um, this one is from Rooster Magazine, August 17th, 2017, which is very interesting. I did not click on this yet. We're doing this together like we always do. We got people following along still. Awesome. Okay, so let's take a look. Yeah, let's, well, no, let's not do that because we want to see this here. Okay, so this is the course that that eclipse in 2017 took across the United States. And it's going to make a giant X. Um, the next one in 20, actually the one this year in October is part of this, I believe. I believe, don't quote me. Wyoming coroners ready for mass suicide of doomsday cults during eclipse. Um, a coroner in Casper, Wyoming has a couple hundred body bags in the ready in case, like, like talk about morbid, right? In case any doomsday cults from Southeast Asia or elsewhere travel to a quiet town and commit mass deletions during the total summer solar eclipse. Wow, that's very morbid. Why Southeast Asia? That doesn't make sense to me. Like, like, are they just, are they really appropriating right there? Like, just saying, like, they're going to come to Gasper, Wyoming, Southeast Asians. Like, wow, that's just different to me. That, that look, okay, I have to be honest here. To me, that's like a clue. My alarm bells in my head are like, ding, 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 ding. Um, <laughs> Southeast Asia. And again, you guys know what I think about the land masses. I think they renamed everything in our generation. So we wouldn't know where we were or who we were. Uh, it's just their MO. They, re they name themselves. They rename themselves. Uh, names have power. They don't want people knowing their real names. Um, <laughs> so it's just bizarre. Wow. Sorry about that. This is a rumor Jacobson has heard and which is floating around the emergency medical community of Wyoming that a cult from abroad is on its way here to pull a Heaven's Gate or Jonestown mass deletion when the moon travels between us and the sun and dark darkens the landscape. To be clear, Jacobson, <laughs> Jacobson does not believe these rumors, and there's no mention of them in the media. She's just saying that she's heard them and that her office is always ready for disaster. Wow. Wow. Like, this is so morbid. Um. Oh, my gosh. I can't. Okay, so I can't read that, and we're going to, like... There's an eclipse fever. <laughs> I'm sorry. From Oregon to South Carolina, a man is searching Craigslist for a woman to, during the depths of darkness, let's skip that, folks predict a collision with a planet, Nibiru, no one's seen. There's talk, even on NPR, that eclipses open a portal. And I've talked about portals and eclipses and the sun at length. And I knew those things before. I ever looked in like into like the the Freemason art and all that type of stuff. <clears throat> wow, wow! And it reminds me again of the Hopi prophecy when they say um, beings that were never meant to walk the earth shall walk the earth uh, at that time. At you know during the end days. So again, God always warns His people. It doesn't matter what culture you are. It really doesn't matter uh, what religion, quote unquote, you are. I do believe that God will come to you, or Christ will come to you. As something or someone you better and you best understand okay it's my opinion you don't have to agree with me let's have a discussion let's not be disrespectful and call people crazy um not only is that not pc which i could care less about it's just ignorant and it's insulting um if that's your only defense in in like a debate uh you're not gonna do well you're not gonna do well in that debate 
I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm still trying to get over what it says there. That's so funny. Wyoming is the least populated state. It's got twice as many cows as people. I can't. As <laughs> the science geeks, myst <clears throat> excuse me, mystics, you know, wetters, families, and occasional doomsday cultists from the rest of the world, especially nearby Colorado, pour in overflowing the hotels and probably... <laughs> Okay, I can't. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. That's <laughs> I apologize. Did I lose everybody? <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, that had me. All right. <laughs> Tampa Bay Times. This is from 1997, okay? And I like to go back. Uh, I feel like <laughs> the closer we get to whatever is coming, uh, kind of the the more base some of us become. So I like to go back because if, if you've read the reading, well, I'll just say I personally think AI is the one putting out a lot of articles at this point through the media and through the Internet uh, because of all the oddness. But again, we're also dealing with people who love their symbolism. So um, let's click on this and see what they got to say. Equinox Eclipse Holy Week. Is there a link to deaths? It is a season of signs and wonders of comets and lunar eclipses of the vernal equinox and the holiest days on the Christian calendar. How many of these converging events, not to mention the approaching approaching decade, influenced the mass deletions discovered Wednesday in a Spanish-style mansion in Southern California, um, Heaven's Gate? This was the question that religious scholars pondered Thursday as they traded theories on the internet, tried mostly unsuccessfully to sign on to the Heaven's Gate website, and took their turns as instant celebrities on CNN and Nightline. There's a confluence of so many important dates. Uh, yes, I'd agree. So we're going to go this way. Even Buddha's birthday is not that far away. It's hard to say which of these correlations were particularly made. And then um, this professor of religion goes on to say, we'll have to wait for more information to see if they were consciously aware of the synchronicity or not. And I actually, I think that, um, I think that that is part of the lie about this alleged cult saying that, that there was a spaceship following that. I think that was to discredit certain things because I've actually watched some of the information that they have and they were they were fasting. They were um, off of animal products. They were doing all these things. And I personally believe this is my personal belief that people um, ascend once they are ready. You know, I think that you you pass on when you achieve a certain level of sanctification or holiness. Okay, and they'll never tell us that. Like they're they're going to debase every good thing and call it evil. And so I don't know that I disagree with this because if you watch the videos of the sneakers and then you have um, the purple uh, claws over their faces, uh, purple is a royalty color or mockery, which they put on Christ. And so it's also a Masonic color. My mother loved purple. I'm not big into purple. Um, now I am though, because, you know, Christ is king. Um, let's see. In this belief, they seem to be close cousins of the solar temple cult. And and that's a big one uh, we might look more into. But which scholars say embraced a stew of beliefs borrowed from New Age philosophy, the Western occult tradi tradition, Gnosticism, and other apocalyptic religions? And again, apocalyptic um, doesn't necessarily mean like it's not the same thing as Armageddon. Uh, you know, and, and people, you know, we sometimes can confuse that and they get conflated and, and used interchangeably at times in, in the media and whatnot. So I like to, you know, I like to say, th say things like that. Solar Temple members also professing a desire to flee the world of matter for the world of the spirit have taken their own deletions or yeah, in three mass deletions in Switzerland, France and Canada. Um, again, and I would question, are they actually doing this to themselves or, and this is just my theory. So again, don't quote me on this. It's a theory. I'm wondering, uh, since nothing happened in their life 
because because one of the lines from the Bible is he who lays down his life for his friend, um, that is the greatest act of love that you can do. And some people have lived a certain part of their life in a certain type of way as to where that might be their only redemption. And so is it possible that they gave each other the Kool-Aid, so to speak? Does that make sense? I don't know if that makes sense. Um, since they didn't have re and so that would be considered laying down your life for your friends possibly i don't again it's a theory i have i'm not saying it's correct i'm not saying it's sane it's just a theory i want to click on that to see if the comments are working but at the same time um back in the day when i used to do that it would turn the video off so that's the only reason i'm not trying to do that so if you have a comment and you think it's important write it down or time write down the time and then um, timestamp the video below when the video posts, and I will post it. Um, I'll share it immediately over to the community page so that you can click on it if you want, and we can discuss this back and forth, right? Because it's, I mean, as much as it's a morbid and a mor ugh, morose type of topic, it's super fascinating to me. It's it, like the way people's minds work to me is like fascinating. And I'm not talking about current psychology i'm talking about like um how the spirit interacts with the body and the mind i guess and and that fascinates me i don't know what it is about that um it's almost like i'm an observer like i'm not even like i'm an alien like i'm not part of part of this place but uh not of this world that's funny i'm wearing that hoodie right now um so some guess that once autopsies were performed in San Diego, it would turn out that the computer cult had taken their lives either at the start of the spring equinox, which occurred March 20th, or the lunar eclipse, which occurred Sunday. And you see how those dates are very close together? Others surmise that, and remember that, because we're going to go to a link here in a minute. Hopefully it, po it populated like it did on the other search engine, because um, I did read one thing, and it... it it actually will tie in with that about how close the dates are, the eclipse is to the actual equin equinox, okay? Others surmise that it was no accident that they died draped in shrouds of purple, the color traditionally associated with Lent. And again, it's also the color of royalty. Um, there's a reason for that because when Christ uh, was being mocked and they put that on the crown of thorns on him, they wrapped him in a purple the color of royalty, a purple, um, I don't know what you call it, purple cloth, purple linen. And, you know, they were mocking him and who knows what exactly happened there. Uh, we know that they definitely weren't kind, um, you know, if you believe the, the Shroud of Turin. And then there is the approach of the year 2000. This transition, this major transition in the calendar, stimulates people's religious imaginations, said Catherine Wessinger, an associate professor at Loyola University in New Orleans. I had uh, my son's, when my oldest son's birthday is the year 2000. And I have to tell you, it was strange. Um, they, they sent me coupons for free stuff all the time. I don't know if anyone else had a child in the year 2000. In the year 2000. Okay, that's not as good as Conan, but um, they would like, that. I got all kind of free stuff, like free diapers, free shoes, free hats. It was the strangest thing. And I was like, well, you know, I'm not going to turn it down. You know, uh, my son, you know, is pretty into it. And it's kind of neat to tell your kid, hey, look, you know, everybody knows about your birthday <laughs> type of thing. So it was kind of neat. But anyways. Okay, all religions are concerned with well-being in our earthly life or after we die. Some believe the only way to achieve well-being is in heaven. Others dream the impossible dream that complete and total well-being can be achieved here on earth. These significant dates get more people hoping for terrestrial salvation, and if they are frustrated, they shift to the other realm. That That's so interesting. I don't know why. That's so interesting to me. One common thre thread among many of the cults that have lately come on the scene is a belief in unidentified flying objects. Space aliens, UFOs, are playing the role that angels, God, Satan used to play. Okay, but it, it's the same thing. They've just, again, rebranded it and renamed it. There's nothing new under the sun. They are unseen superhuman powers who can hurt or help us. Okay, so now we're... Oh, Carl Jung. 
Elwood, the religion professor, harked back to an essay about flying saucers by Carl Jung. He's actually one of the pioneers of or psychiatry. Jung calls them technologic, technologic angels, the professor explained, because they have an otherworldly quality. They are sublime, transcendent beings that fulfill the same function as angels, but adopted to a technologic civilization. So again, we you know, he's very close there. But if you don't have, if you don't at least read the Bible, you're missing out on a lot of, you know, these things, how they tie together and a lot of dots. Okay. So now we're going to go. Now I like going here to, to, uh, villain wiki, uh, to fandom because again, there's truth in fiction, right? And sometimes it's easier to slip truth into fiction than it is per se to get people to read the Bible or to get them to read Greek mythology. People don't like to read, you know? Um, oh geez, an ad. No, can you just go away? Oy vey. Full name, the eclipse. Okay. Alias, attackers, eclipse cultists. Origin, Horizon Zero Dawn. Foundation, two years before the events of Horizon Zero Dawn. Headquarters, Sunfall. Commanders, uh, Sillens is the creator, formerly, and then, so you get into all these different things, and agents, and they're all, they're all related, right? And it gives you their powers, their skills, and, um, and what they do, and so sometimes that's a good place to look. So again, remember certain things that you just saw there. Okay, so... TV tropes. Hold, please. No. Huh. Yikes. All right, we're not going to go there right away. All right, so we're going to have to look at... Fiddle D... Oh, Sammy. I'm looking for a specific link. Hold, please. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> He's dreaming. I'm sorry. <laughs> um. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all right. Stop. Okay. So, here we get into Egyptology. <laughs> Sam. Hey. Stop. It's Okay. A solar deity or sun deity is a deity who represents the sun or an aspect of it. And what we're going to see um, tomorrow, right? Well, we might see part of it is a solar eclipse, I believe. Such deities are usually associated with power and strength. Solar deities and sun worship, and not to be confused with SON worship, can be found throughout most of recorded history in various forms. The sun is sometimes referred to by its Latin name, Sol, or by its Greek name, Helios. The English word sun derives from Proto-Germanic, Sunno. Okay, so let's look at... There's Ra, the um, Egyptian god of the sun. And they say that Ra kind of parallels Christ, right? And they will tell you that Christ is another version of Ra. Um, I don't believe that to be true myself. I do believe history kind of repeats in certain ways um, and that there are parallels and types and shadows all over the place, right? And oftentimes a variety of different cultures will tell the same story in their own cult from their own cultural standpoint, okay? So pre-dynasty Egyptian beliefs attribute at, at, at um, Adam. Uh, Adam, yeah, Adam, that makes sense, A-T-O-M and A-D-A-M, as the sun god and Horus, as god of the sky and sun, as the old kingdom the theocracy gained influence, early beliefs were incorporated into the expanding popularity of Ra and the Osiris Horus mythology. Adam became Ra Adam, the rays of the setting sun, and that's funny because when you look up, um, is it savior, is it savior? I forget what word it is in gematria when you use the gematria calculator. Um, rays of the sun 
not Ra, but Ray with the Y added, are said to be um, the savior. It's just, you know, it's all these different, you have these types and shadows and these parallels, right, that are shown in the, st in the sky and then on the land and then in this culture and that culture with different people. It's almost like, I don't want to, I don't want to offend anyone or use the wrong word here, but it's almost like every, that there's, okay, there's more than, there, there's a variety of templates and let's say that, okay, there is a, a raw in China and there's a raw in Japan and there's a raw in, it's almost like there's just that way everybody is involved in the main story and no matter where you are, you're going to get the gospel, so to speak. And I, and again, I don't want to use that in the, way, the wrong way, but I'm not a person who believes like you can just hang your sins on Christ. I don't, I don't follow that, that rhetoric. Um, and then, you know, just use it as like a jet, get out of jail free card. I, I don't, I think it's disrespectful. Um, I think he showed us how to walk this out and that's, you know, I will have people that disagree with me and that's fine. Um, but that's, that's my belief. You don't have to agree with me. And that's, that's where we can learn from each other. So we're going to get out of here and I want to look at, um, let's just look at this because I'm looking for something very specific. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, it's the name of a book. Wonderful. <laughs> no wonder. Hold, please. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Okay. There has to be a way to do this. Oh, I knew what I can look up. There we go. I want to use this very specific. Okay. The Christian Gospels say that the sky was darkened for hours after the crucifixion of Jesus, which historians viewed either as a miracle or a portent of dark times to come. Later, historians used astronomy to pinpoint the death of Christ based pinpoint the death of Christ based on this eclipse mention. Okay, so we're going to actually look at that. The Gospel of Luke account states, and the sun was darkened. However, the biblical details do not accord with an eclipse. A solar eclipse could not have occurred on or near Passover when Jesus was crucified and would have been too brief to account for three hours of darkness. Hold, please. <laughs> and again, limiting God. Let's not limit the creator of everything, of the stars, the earth, the sky, the trees, us, man, woman. Let's not, do, I, I, I personally dislike that. Um, it very well could have happened. Allegedly, there was also an earthquake. Okay. So let's check this out. It's from mainstream, but it's, it gets pretty interesting. Okay. Since ancient times, people have viewed the moon completely blacking out the sun for mere minutes. The entire solar eclipse as the moon shadow moves across the earth can take hours as omens that indicate an impending miracle, the wrath of God, or the doom of a ruling dynasty. Oh, hold, please. What's interesting, um, they say that it could not have occurred in that one th thing we just looked at. How However, as we saw in the Heaven's Gate link, there was an equinox, the spring equinox, and there was an eclipse in between when they were found, quote-unquote, deleted, okay? So I think that's that's important and worth mentioning. Um, the entire solar eclipse as the moon's shadow moves across Earth can take hours as omens that indicate an impending miracle, the wrath of God, or the doom of a ruling dynasty. From the earliest recorded eclipse described on an ancient clay tablet in Ugarit in modern-day Syria, I'd love to go to Syria. I just, I don't know why I'm fascinated with that place. 
to one that was linked to an uprising in an ancient Assyrian city to a total solar eclipse that will surely go down in history when it dazzles the world in 2017. Here are some of the most famous eclipses. Great American Total Solar Eclipse The first total solar eclipse when the moon moves directly between Earth and the sun, visible in the U.S. in nearly four decades, is expected to dazzle on August 21st, 2017. And we know what happened there. And Space.com, I actually really like them for um, their eclipse and, and their astrolog- or astronomical, astro- <laughs> whatever, for their information. Live Science's sister site. During most solar eclipses, the moon takes a bite out of the sun. These are called partial solar eclipses. This eclipse is particularly rare for its accessibility. Okay. Um, the August event will go down as the first, first total solar eclipse whose path of totality stays completely in the U.S. since, who's a history buff, 1776. What is that close to? Independence Day for the United States. That's ironic. And it, it looks like people, as we're seeing now, um, we're getting stirred up, right? Um, what happens in the stars greatly affects what happens on the earth and we are living beings and we are made of elements and water and all these things that are conductors and it can make us you know if people are bl- blaming 5g and that's possible i you know i did a video about that the other day but um i also understand that people still have to live here so let's say the l eats um oh that's funny i didn't realize it sounded that way i just always typed it out that way I know that the E-L is angel, but eats, L eats. What do the L's eat? Okay, I don't even want to go there. <laughs> uh, maybe I'm punch drunk. I don't know. I'm pretty sober, so that's not really possible. For anyone who plans to check out the summer eclipse, never or remember to never look directly at the sun without proper eye protection, except during the brief period of totality when the moon has moved completely between the sun and earth. So let's say, let's say for argument's sake, Um, let's talk this out. If there are gates, aka portals, possibly opening up in the sun at any given time, but especially during an eclipse, and you look up at the eclipse, and your eyes are gates, right? Eye gates, ear gates. What happens? Okay, let's, again, you're looking up when it's totality, You're not going to go blind, right? But could another being from somewhere else enter into you via your eye gates? I've actually been wondering that since this uh, 2017 eclipse. I just want, it's just something, food for thought. Uh, Ugarit eclipse. One of the earliest solar eclipses recorded. uh, The Ugarit eclipse darkened the sky for two minutes and seven seconds on May 3rd. 1375, according to an analysis of a clay tablet discovered in 1948. I don't know what's up with that date, but between 1935 and like 1948, 45, 48, I don't want to quote anything right now, but that's when all kinds of things from like the Dead Sea Scrolls were found and um, extra canonical gospels were found. Um, I think that's, that's very interesting. And so we have that Syrian eclipse, 736 BC. Um, the sun was completely eclipsed for five minutes and that's pretty long compared to what they're going on here. Early Chinese eclipse in 1302 BC, Chinese historians documented an epic total eclipse that blocked out the sun for six minutes and 25 seconds because the sun was the symbol of the emperor an eclipse was seen as a warning to the leader after an eclipse an emperor would eat vegetarian meals and perform rituals to rescue the sun according (laughs) wow that's neat you see how different cultures have these different beliefs and if you're not of that culture it might not make any sense to you that's why i'm i'm very I'm not somebody that says demon all the time. However, however, lately, it seems like we have a whole lot of diabolical activities 
occurring. <laughs> um, so then they get into that one. Crucifixion of Jesus. So let's see what... Some of those are just hard to look at. Uh, the Christian Gospels say that the sky was darkened for hours after the crucifixion of Jesus, which historians viewed either as a miracle or a portent of dark times to come. Um, later, historians used astronomy to pinpoint the death of Christ based on this eclipse mentioned. Some historians tie the crucifixion to a total solar eclipse lasting one minute and 59 seconds that occurred in the year 29 CE. Others say a second total eclipse blocking the sun for four minutes and six seconds in 33 CE marked Jesus' death. Okay. And so you have, again, that this is close to... Um, uh, what am I? Solstice as well, but they didn't mention it in that one, but they did in the other link. Uh, the birth of Muhammad. Wow, that's an interesting. I thought Quran was spelt with a Q. Huh. The Quran mentions an eclipse that preceded the birth of Muhammad. Historians later tied this to a total eclipse that lasted three minutes, 17 seconds, seconds in 569 CE. The sun also disappeared for one minute and 40 seconds after the death of Muhammad's son, Ibrahim. If I pronounced that wrong, I apologize. But the world's first Muslims didn't believe that eclipse was a sign from God. Instead, according to Islamic texts called the Hadith, Muhammad proclaimed, The sun and the moon do not suffer eclipse for anyone's death or life. Yeah, but if you reverse that, someone's birth or death, um, you know, could hasten, could, it could be a marker, right? The creator, the grand creator, the creator of everything, um, the main honcho, head honcho. It's very possible certain people are born at certain times and there are certain signs in the heavens. Sorry. <laughs> when you read a lot, you kind of, out loud, you kind of, get a gummy mouth uh so they're talking about this here king henry's eclipse oh my let's see what this has to say when king henry the first of england the son of william the conqueror died in ad 1133 wow that's there's some gematria for you the event coincided with a total solar eclipse that lasted four minutes and 38 seconds in the manuscript historia novella william of malmesbury <laughs> recounts that the hideous darkness agitated the hearts of men. And again, we've seen this we, we, over and over. You see that this seems to be a thing where, where people will get all stirred up, so some violence will erupt and or break out, and then once that event is over, everybody kind of comes back to their senses. There's a reason. I mean, I, I love the stars. I, I love sleeping under the stars, laying in a hammock under the sun. It's just... You know, I, I, it's God's handiwork, and I love it. Um, but during eclipses, I don't go outside. Like, I don't play with those. That's just me, personally. You, you can call it superstition, but you can see that it does something to people. And so I, I, kind, of, I kind of just chill and, and do my thing. And, you know, I don't, I don't go out and gallivant or anything like that. That's just me. It's just me. You don't have to be like me. Um, after the death, a struggle for the throne threw the kingdom into chaos and civil war. Okay, so in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, a passage also recounts this eclipse. In this year, King Henry went over sea at Lamas. And the second day, as he lay and slept on the ship, the day darkened over all lands. And the sun became, as it were, a three-night-old moon. And the stars about it. At midday, men were greatly wonder-stricken and were affrighted, and said that a great thing should come thereafter. So it did. For the same year, the king died on the following day after St. Andrew's Mass Day, December 2nd, in Normandy. Hold, please. I want to address something here. Um, men were greatly wonder-stricken and were affrighted, okay? Again, something ha When trauma, when, when somebody experiences trauma and you know this because of, of pregnant women 
I, I know this because I've researched it because I've, I've dealt with this my in my life uh, with my mother and myself. Um, when a person experiences trauma, it literally affects your DNA. It does something to your DNA, okay? So if it can leave that much of a signature, if you will, on someone's DNA, on, on their genetics, then I, you know, why, who's not to say that it does something to the hearts of men? And, and that reminds me of the verse, um, oh, what's, how's it go? And men shall, shall, um, their hearts shall fail them because of what comes upon the earth. Einstein's eclipse. Wow, that's new. I never heard of that. You guys still with me? Wow, that's awesome. While the ancients viewed eclipses as signs of great acts of God, physicists view the 1919, wow, look at that, 1919, the numbers and the sun um, and moon. Physicists viewed the 1919 solar eclipse as a triumph of science. During 1919's epic eclipse in which the sun vanished for six minutes, Okay, that's almost like 666 there. And 51 seconds, scientists measured the bending of light from the stars as they passed near the sun. The findings confirmed Einstein's theory of general relativity, which describes gravity as a warping of space and time. That's fascinating. I really like that. Okay, now I want to see, there's a particular, was there a blood moon at Jesus' crucifixion? It has become common in Christian and especially in creationist circles to claim that the crucifixion was on April 3rd, AD 33, and that the lunar eclipse that evening was a fulfillment of the Joel 231 prophecy of the moon being turned to blood. So if such a thing possibly did happen at his death, would it then would it would it then reason, because again, we're we're dealing with cyclical events here would it then stand to reason that during his second coming we would see similar signs and that these prophecies would repeat and that's why we're seeing things repeat and, and that's that's worth thinking on too i think that's these are things that i meditate upon right meditation does not mean to empty your mind when people tell you that i mean it's just not Number one, it's not doable for me. My mind is never empty. But it's not a good thing to do. Because then you're creating that vacuum in your mind and something else can come in and take its place. I forget what that theory is called. I've tried looking it up. I might not be using the right words or verbiage. But um, maybe it's like replacement theory or something. But when, when you have a vacuum, when you have a hole, um, there is no empty space. So something will move into that vacuum or hole. Okay? All right, let's see. So this is 20. These are both in 2017. And we're going to go to Salt Lake because that's where that's where um, the headquarters of the LDS church is. So I'm I always kind of click on things that are there just to see what they're saying about stuff. Um, and I believe the Salt Lake Tribune. Are you not going to? Yeah, no, I don't want to do this. One free article remaining. Wow, geez, they are really, like, they're all about the money. They're all about them shekels. Did a solar eclipse darken the skies during Jesus' crucifixion? Um, this is May 20th, 2012. And that whole year was kind of bonkers, too. Is a scene familiar from movies and even some modern translations of the Bible. As Jesus Christ hangs on the cross, an eclipse blots out the sun. But did a total, total solar eclipse actually darkened the skies during the crucifixion. For centuries, scholars have debated the exact date of Jesus' death and questioned whether an eclipse could have happened at that time. While most, attempt, mm, while most attempts to work out dates of historical events based on astronomical events can be problematic. Problematical? I didn't know that was a word. This one is easy. Brother Guy... Eh, brother. Yeah, it's definitely... Brother Guy... Consul Magnil, director of the Vatican Observatory, wrote in an email to Religion News Service, and their, their uh, telescope is named Lucifer, ironically enough. Um, so, I wanted to touch on something there. 
Oh, there's a story, and I'm going to look it up because it, it was around 2012 when things were going kind of haywire the last time in a, in history, for us, at least recent history, um, that a town in Mexico, um, specifically at some type of lab um, or observatory, some type of scientific site, that the people just disappeared. They were just not there anymore. Uh, the town, the local town, it was kind of like Roanoke, how people just disappeared. I need to remember to look that up because I've not heard a follow-up on that story and it was very short. So again, it might be clues into what's going on during these types of events. Okay, so let's get out of here and we'll do one, one or two more and then we can end this live stream. Um, was the darkness of the crucifixion there? Now, I actually went to... Fiddle D D. What I was looking for, I cannot is not like in here. August twenty fourth, twenty seventeen. Darkness at Jesus Natural Cafe. Uh, all right, we're gonna check into this, cause say what you will about Catholics, they are. I don't. Well, I shouldn't use that word. They're very particular about documentation. Very particular. Um, if you have a catechism book. Oh my gosh, it's actually hard for me to read because it's just there's all these dates and citations and this, that, and the other. So they're very particular about that. It's almost like they house all the historical information that we have access to, which actually kind of makes sense when you consider the rumors about, you know, the Vatican and the basement and the libraries and all, all the things they have there. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed. Okay? So they're saying about three hours. Um, and, and that's a pattern. That's another pattern in, in Christ's life, and people like Christ, is that three. Three days for, um, res, or for, bleh. three days he descended and was in hell, um, allegedly, if you follow the Bible. Um. There's just all these three days, three days of a fast, 72 hours, uh, releases what's called this chrism serum through your body, and it resets your body. I'm not a doctor. This is not med medical advice. Um, it's just something I've greatly researched. You can research it. A man walks with a camel. No kidding. Really? I <laughs> some. Um, two questions arise to this phenomenon described in the Gospels. Other passages intending to say that this darkness covered the entire earth? Are these passages necessarily referring to an eclipse? Okay, we're going to, I want to look at one more thing because I want to see, um, uh, there we go. Because like I said, there was a rumor, um, some, I don't know where I read that, but that there was an earthquake during Corp Christ's uh, crucifixion as well, that the earth shook. Um, so we're going to look at this. We'll go to, huh, that's from 2017. Let's check it out. Can a solar eclipse trigger an earthquake? This gravitational pull of the sun and the moon, because it, it does, it is a gravity thing, right? And you have these bodies, for lack of a better word, they are, um, what am I, what do I want to say? They're circling each other, right? The sun, the moon, the earth, and they're in this orbit, right? And they do this dance and it's almost like a tug pull type of thing or push pull type of thing. It makes sense that gravity could affect the plate tectonics and potentially trigger earthquakes. In a solar eclipse, the earth, sun, and moon are aligned. So you expect the effect to be greatest. Is there a correlation between eclipses and earthquakes? The short answer is yes, but it's not really the eclipse that increases the probability, but the lunar phase. And I think this is important to look at as well. Again, it's always good to be prepared for any event, anything that might happen, um, to the best that you can be prepared. I, I might not be able to physically prepare people, but let, let's prepare our spirit, you know? Let, let's be strong and let's not... Walk in fear and ignorance, which is darkness. Let's let's bring these things to light so that we can 
better operate with our environment, with the animals, with the sun, moon, and stars, with the waters of the seas. Again, I'm getting philosophical there, but that's just that's just me, and that's what I believe personally. Um, how an eclipse might trigger an earthquake. According to the USGS, recent studies indicate a correlation between high ocean tides and earth tides and earthquakes on shallow thrust faults and undersea subduction zones. And what do we have? Um, the San Andreas Fault and uh, the Great Madrid Fault, okay? In my testimony, um, I had a dream about that, that. That's how God woke me up was with this crazy dream I had. Um, but I believe it was more of an encounter and somebody kind of playing um, mad scientist on me. But in the midst of that happening, I was like literally raised up and away from the situation. And I like literally went through the roof of my, my house at the time when I lived a few roads away. And um, I looked over because it's like I was still in the chair, almost like a dentist chair or a barber chair, how it goes up and down. And I looked over and I saw this great chasm in the earth. And um, that's kind of like that's <laughs> God woke me up in a radical type of way. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of people, and I'm not the only one, I'm not special. There's a lot of people having these types of dreams and experiences. And again, God, the creator, whatever word you're comfortable with, source, higher consciousness always warns us. You know, if you want to call it like a psychic, you know, predictive type of thing, I don't care what you call it. I just want you to be prepared for any event throughout life, right? Um, you can't come to me for medical advice and you can't really come to me for um, chemistry or things like that. But um, if you need research done, I'm your girl. <laughs> okay. A correlation between high ocean tides and earth tides and earthquakes on shallow thrust faults and undersea subduction zones. I find that fascinating too. That would be why you would have high tide or higher tide is because of these subduction zones that are in the ocean, right? And what does Revelation also speak of? It speaks of a great beast coming out of the sea. And that's very possible. I've seen a, and I'm, gonna, I'm a movie buff. I'm going to reference movies again. But um, there are a lot of movies out there about great chasms opening up on the ocean floor and then things that are ancient from like the the... Uh, Mesozoic um, timeline or the, um, you know, dinosaur type things like like giant sea creatures coming up out of the ocean because allegedly there's an ocean under the ocean. You, I don't know if you ever watched like no, Nova, but um, they've taken little, little, I don't know what you call them, little cars type things, um, little, little mini submarines under the water and they hit rock bottom and then they've actually found lakes and um in one of those videos in one of these underwater lakes how you have an underwater lake I don't know but um they went into the lake and they actually bounced off the bottom it was almost like they hit plexiglass so uh waters above waters below that whole thing is just like fascinating right if only these scientists would actually read the Bible, maybe they are smart enough and smarter than someone like me, um, a layperson, to, to bring these things together for us. So in an earth tide or body tide, the gravity of the sun and moon displace the earth's surface and ocean tide works the same way, except it's water that moves rather than land. Both types of high tides occur during the full and new moon. A lunar eclipse occurs during a full moon while a solar eclipse Solar eclipses, sorry, occurs during the new moon. But there is no statistical increase in seismic activity compared with any other new or full moon. If you stop to think about it, the alignment between the Earth, Sun, and Moon is very precise during an eclipse. But the bodies come close to that alignment relatively often. During Earth tides, the surface of the crust rises or falls by a few centimeters. The ocean tides have a more pronounced effect. Some ocean tides change the sea level by over a meter. That's, that's huge for this type of thing, uh, which changes the pressure on subduction zones and the faults near the edges of the continents. Hold, please. 
I don't know how long you guys have been watching YouTube, but there is something called, I want to, I want to say it's the Navy map. Okay. And it shows how the Mississippi river opens up and covers, you know, floods. It separates the United States and it floods, um, the States surrounding it. Um, so that's another thing to be mindful of, right. To, to, you know, kind of just be alert, right? Just be alert. That's all. What's the risk? How significant is the increased risk? The USGS calculation estimates a three times increased risk of an earthquake. That actually does seem like a lot. While this may seem like a lot, the risk at any given time is extremely low. So multiplying it by three still yields an extremely tiny pro probability of any occurrence. Again, you don't want to start a panic. I get it. Uh, the semi diurnal, ew, diurnal, diurnal. Okay, tides also affect seismic activity and have been connected with aftershocks in volcanic regions. Even so, the chance of an earthquake occurring is the same whether it is day or night in the region. That's pretty dope. I'm showing my age again. That's really cool. Um, let me see if there's anything else we should check out. Forbes is usually not too bad. Mm -mm -mm -mm. The effect is negligible and small. Okay, well, this is pretty cool. Um, all right, so what I'm going to do is end this video, but I already have a really good idea about what I want to do next. And we will continue the Arcturus study possibly tomorrow before this eclipse is, is alleged to take place. Oh, let's look at that real quick. What time is the eclipse? And what date is it? April. So it's four. April 20th at... Is that 2.37 a.m. or p.m.? It might be a.m. that I read, but I'm not sure. So Australia is really going to get the brunt of this. And the islands, which actually, if, you know, they were talking about how the amount was negligible. But if you're on a little island like that, um, it actually might be more, you know, be increased. The risk might be increased, okay? First location to see the full eclipse begin, maximum eclipse, 556. Okay, what is it a.m., p.m., what? What time? 419. Okay, occurs on Wednesday, April 19th at 912 and Thursday, April 20th at 1212. Ugh, that's weird. Um, so is that tonight? Is that now? Right now? Okay, well, y'all are on call. <laughs> Be watchful. Um, let's make sure that that's reliable. The eclipse is currently in progress. Wow. Um, I wonder, am I allowed to go to a YouTube channel? How can I watch it now? How can I watch it now? Can anyone? Oh, I can't even talk to you guys because the comments aren't working. Fiddle DD. So that is right now three shadows, three eclipse types. That's that's kind of creepy. A so and like I said, three three like that's a that's a thing. A solar eclipse occurs when the moon's shadow falls on the Earth. The shadow consists of three areas: an umbra, a penumbra, and an antumbra. The type of eclipse we see depends on part of the moon's shadow we are in. Wow, so I, ha you know, I did stay in for the eclipse. I'm right here. Awesome. Next hybrid eclipse. Can we? No, I don't. Oh, I hate ads. How Can I see it now? Are we allowed to do this? I have the thing up for. Yes. So all of these, uh, all of these uh, features. Wow. It is right now, guys. Are you still there? Awesome. There it is.
Do, do, do. That is so dope. Okay, so what I can do is end this. And if you guys want, I can um, copy and paste the link to the community tab. And you can bounce over there and watch it for yourselves. Hey, Sammy, careful. All right, so I'm going to run. I'm going to check it out myself. And I will go ahead and um, copy and paste this over on the community tab so you guys know where to go check it out. And obviously, Sammy has need of a potty break. Thank you guys so much for being here. This was a lot of fun, totally informative. I love learning new things with you. And so, you know, if you had something you wanted to comment on, you wanted to talk about, don't forget to post it on the um, video. I love you guys. Be 